Hello everyone, welcome to this very special stream. Uh, it's a Fermion and Leptos stream today. My name is Sohan Maheshwar and I have Mikkel here. Uh, ben from Leptos is facing some technical difficulties, so he'll be joining us very soon. He was here literally five minutes ago, but I think, you know, things happen with computers, so we'll, we'll give him some time. Uh, Mikkel, quick introduction perhaps, and uh, hi to a bunch of folks from the Leptos and the Spin discords over here uh, who are super excited to learn about both Leptos and Spin. Cool. Yeah. Thank you, Soan. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Mikkel. I've been here before. <laughs> been here as a host. Been here as the thing that's not the host. I assume a guest. <laughs> so the plan today was basically for me to, um, together with uh, Ben, uh, walk through some of the integration work that we've been doing to get Spin and Leptus working together and talk about, you know, Leptus, talk about Spin and, and how they how we believe they are a great, um, a great pair to build, you know, awesome web applications. Yeah, absolutely. And I see so many familiar faces like Bunny, um, David Wallace Croft, and a bunch of other folks, Matt as well, but also some newer faces, including Diversible from Vancouver Island. Hello, Diversible, also one of the co-contributors of the Leptos framework. Uh, there's Marcus, um, there's I Like a Dark Cookie, I like that name. <laughs> Uh, there's also Trusty Bits, who was curious about Fermion and Spin. So, yeah, very cool. And uh, Ben is here, who, well, welcome, Ben, uh, who's, who had internet difficulties, but thank you so much for being here, Ben. Yeah, we'll give this a shot. I'm not sure how long it'll hold up. <laughs> I blame Comcast. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So my work here is done. I think I've had the easiest job in just sort of introducing our guests and saying hi to everyone. So I will go off screen, but I will be in chat. Uh, hey, Dean, as well. Uh, Mikkel, Ben, over to you. Thanks, Owen. <laughs> glad, glad you joined me, Ben. So I don't have to try to spell my way through through all the Leptus stuff on my own. Uh, I really need you here. <laughs> you want to do some a quick introduction for the audience. Sure. Uh, my name is Ben Wasovich. Um, I am a web developer. Uh, I joined the Leptos project pretty close to its inception, back before we had an Axum integration and a lot of the nice things that we now take for granted. Um, and I feel like I'm slowly learning it. You know, there's a lot of black magic in a fine grained reactivity system. And, you know, parsing all that out is difficult, um, but I try and yeah, that's me. Cool. And you are, you're one of the, you're one of the maintainers of the project today, right? Yes. Yes. Cool. And how many, how many people are you maintaining the project? Just to get a little bit of sense of like the size of it and um, contributions. <laughs> I would say that. Um, Greg does the vast majority, and then I do. Um, and feature contributions and stuff. So it's a little bit hard to count, you know, how many people that actually is. We, unlike, say, Diopsis or React, no one is funding us or sponsoring us. So this is all volunteer work. Awesome. Okay. Cool. You, we had a little bit of a fallout there, but I think we got the the the, the, the gist of, of what you were saying. So, um, we'll we'll see how well we can go along the way. Um, but maybe Ben, do you want to do? I think what we want to do is like you know get a little bit of an introduction on the Leptus uh, on what Lep, the Leptus project for anyone in here who doesn't know Leptus, and then we can do some introduction of Spin for anyone who doesn't know Spin, and then we can sort of end up in that whole stuff we build around the integration maybe a little bit later um sure. so yeah Absolutely. i think you called leptus a fine-grained reactive system like do you <laughs> want to expand a little bit on that like how would you what is leptus and you know how would you describe it and compare it to other uh web application frameworks sure. so um leptos um, is, as you said, a, a full stack web framework, right? We're designed to let you build UI interfaces on the web like React or Next.js or Svelte or whatever. Um, the primary difference between, say, something like React and something like Leptos is that um, we are a signals-based framework. 
we have a f system that uses fine grain reactivity. And that basically boils down to the idea that instead of um, rendering a view, diffing that view, diffing a new view against that view, and then reloading everything that changed, we can selectively target bits of the page, data that's changed, and re-render just that bit. So it's a lot, it's very similar to solid JS, if any of you have used that um, in the JS world. Um, yeah, that's um, we've got a variety of backends that you can plug into. We support a variety of rendering methods from server-side rendering to static site generation. Um, so we, we're really pretty happy with our feature set right now. Cool. Yeah. So how? So Leptis, Leptis is a Rust framework, right? And mm -hmm. and and so when you talk about the the choices that one would have in terms of doing client side rendering, server side rendering, mm -hmm. um, there is some WebSMD in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> right? Oh, absolutely. There's absolutely some WebAssembly in there. I mean, we're definitely trying to minimize the amount of WebAssembly in there to some degree. But um, so the so let's say that you're server side rendering a Leptos app, right? Um, you go to Google.com or um, Fermion.dev or whatever, and it renders the page as much as it can on the server. That HTML is sent down to the client, and then What's also sent down is a WebAssembly bundle and a JS file to load it. So on the client, then, we will load that WebAssembly module to give you interactivity, to give you event handlers, to um, load some of the data that maybe you haven't quite finished loading yet. And yeah, it's, WebAssembly is crucial for us to give us that last bit. Right, That's the part that's kind of been missing in the Rust web world until fairly recently. We've had Actix, we've had Axum, they're great at server-side rendering, but what about what you want to do on the client afterwards? So. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, yeah. so, 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 so one of the main, I guess one of the unique benefits you get of using Leptis is that you can actually do client-side code written in Rust, right? Oh yeah, Absolutely. Um, the client side code is pretty seamlessly generated from Rust code. Um, the biggest requirement for that is just to make sure it compiles to WebAssembly. Not everything does. Um, but yeah, we try to make that as painless and transparent as possible. Cool. Do you, so um, before we dive into the spin side of things, do you maybe just want to show us like, a brief glimpse of what 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 would a sort of get started Leptus application look like? Um, sure, let's do that. So to be perfectly honest, since I had to switch computers since my internet's out, so I don't quite have everything prepped, but I can absolutely download one of the samples and see what's going on here. Let's see. Ooh, I don't even have spin installed on this thing. So maybe we <laughs> want to talk about spin first and I'll I'll set that up a little bit while you while you're doing that. Okay, cool. Yeah, I can do that. I can I can do a brief introduction <laughs> about spin. So so um so spin is a project that um the Fermion team has been building now for the last two years. I think a few months out, spin is gonna be two years old. Um Spin is a project that enabled you to run WebAssembly server side. So even though we know that the WebAssembly specification was built uh, for exactly the purpose of what Leptis is doing, you know, take other programming languages, the JavaScript, and make them execute inside of a browser environment. There is a specification called WASI, which is the WebAssembly system interface that enables you to get APIs that you would expect if you want to run something as a server or server side. So that's why we talk about this as WebAssembly server side as well. Um, because of some of the unique, um, you know, design choices or value propositions around using WebAssembly, uh, which, which basically come from how the specification was written for the browser, which means that you want small binaries that load very quickly, 
that are portable and that execute uh, in a secure way, sandboxed. Um, all of these things are great to have server side as well. And um, <laughs> thanks, buddy. You're doing great at adapting and overcoming here. Um, but yeah, no, all these value propositions makes a lot of sense on the server side. And and the way that Spin has sort of adopted those is to to build a programming model or provide a programming model that is very similar to um, a serverless framework like uh, Lambda, um, AWS Lambda, for instance. Um, the way that, that Spin works is that you have this concept of a trigger that is basically the entry point into the function that you write. Now, the trigger could be an HTTP request. It could be an event coming from listening on a message queue or, or other places. Um, and basically, what you as a developer would provide is the code or the logic to handle that trigger or handle that event. So if it's an HTTP request, you get a re uh, re an HTTP request in within your code. You do something you want to do with it, and you send an HTTP response back. That, that all seems fairly... Uh, straightforward or even simple in that sense um sort of the some of the magic behind what we can do because this is WebAssembly, is that the 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 function or the code that you write we, we call it a component and there's a tie into a web assembly component model which we may or may not talk about later but that component is compiled to a web assembly binary and the execution model inside of spin is so that you have a, a spin host, and if you run spin on your local machine, you would you would use a command called spin up that basically runs the host and loads an application manifest that is a, a TOML file that you provide. That manifest provides a, a list of components. You can have multiple components in there that are basically set up to be triggered by various events. Um, what's relevant for this case typically would be that to be a list of components that are triggered by HTTP requests. And each component may listen to a unique path within you know, the endpoint that the host is, is, is opening. So, so you can imagine the, the, the execution flow and model to be that the, you load a spin host. It has sort of the registry of all the WebAssembly components that is going to serve the individual paths. And not until a request actually hit the host, the host will go and load the WebAssembly from disk hand over the request, the request is being handled by your code and send back a response. And then immediately after that, the WebAssembly component will be unloaded and released from memory. Uh, and that is a very powerful model in terms of how these things uh, operate because you can easily imagine how you basically get scaled to zero for free um, because nothing is loaded and handled and, and hold inside memory unless there are things that actually need to be done. Um, and all of this is possible without seeing an impact on, 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 on requests because the WebAssembly loads so, so quickly and because they're so small in size. Um, so that's sort of like the, the core of what the spin model is. Um, so yeah, that, that, was my, that was my introduction to spin. I think, well, I think the, the, the missing <laughs> point there might be that, you know, uh, in spin, we have SDKs for various languages. Um, like we know that there are, there are certain levels of maturity in language support um, uh, for WebAssembly, um, but for Rust, we have like the more, more the most mature SDK for Spin. We also provide SDKs for JavaScript, TypeScript, uh, for Go, and for Python. Some experimentation around C Sharp uh, also exists as well. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other things that we build into the Spin model, and and we can also talk about a other hosting options than running them yourself. We have a cloud where you can run them. We have some experimentation around hosting these things in Kubernetes and other places and sort of building out a full set of, you know, services that you want for persisting data and AI and other things. But maybe we can do that a little bit later. You, it might look like you might be ready, Ben, to show us something. Is that? Yes. I have um, just managed to compile, which took a while because crappy internet. Um, yeah, so let's see. Let's. Uh, I haven't actually tried sharing my screen with StreamYard yet, so this will be interesting. Okay, can you see that? Uh, yes. Yes. All right. Perfect. So 
this is one of Greg and I's favorite examples, right? It's a Hacker News clone. And it's a great example of um, how it works in general, right? This is a server-side rendered app. Um, this one is running on Axum. Um, and for example, if I were to go over here and show you the network view, when I reload this thing, you can kind of see the process. Um, it sends a GET request to the server, which returns this HTML shell. And then it loads this WebAssembly file. And yeah, and we get a fully interactive interface. I mean, I can, I I don't can click think around did, here. I, I don't think we um, saw the, uh, the network. It doesn't show you the, the network tab. No, it doesn't. You might have only shared the one tab. Ooh, that's tricky. All right, let's do <laughs> try this one more time. Can I just share the whole screen window, entire screen? OK, you can just see my pain here. All right, can you see, can you see it now? <laughs> let's see, it's loading. Uh, so hopefully you can see it now. But it, returns the HTML shell as I said, and will load JS, which will instantiate this module, load this web assembly module, and give full interactivity on the post and they don't need any web for the we've the default forms. Um, but uh, you can get more pages, but uh, it would still work. And that's been really crucial for us is maintaining that no JS activity, which is kind of funny to say considering that. You know, so I think I, I think unfortunately we lost connection with Ben right now. Sharing the full screen was was apparently too much. Um, let's do this. Let's hope that Ben get, gets reconnected. Uh, and while Ben hopefully gets reconnected, and we'll see how we can get that up and running, uh, let me try to walk you through uh, an example that we built on the integration. And I will I will spill the best of my leftist knowledge, which is not enough. So I hope anyone on chat just correct me whenever I say something that may or may not be true. Um, <laughs> oh, hey, Ben. <laughs> I'm back again, back. you know. It, it drops I, I, out the sometimes. screen sharing unfortunately did not did not work. You, you know what uh, I think we can do? Let's let's do this. Maybe. Let's maybe try and just jump into the integration thing because I can share that and then yes. hopefully we can pull together all the pieces of what's left us, what's spin in that integration, and, and maybe we can guide people through it that way. Should we try yes, that? Yes, let's let's try that. <laughs> okay, let's do that. <laughs> Oh man. This is gonna be so much fun. Okay, I am gonna share my screen and I um, should be able to do that screen. I'm just gonna move a stream thing over there. Um I guess now we now we only need Sohan on the side to actually show my screen. Okay, there you go. Okay. All so right. I think yeah, I think the thing that would be good to start with. So um, one of our colleagues at Fermion, Ivan Talson, uh, did this integration. I'm just going to throw in the a link to the blog post that actually introduces this in the chat so everyone has that. We call this WASM all the way because we, we, we like this idea of doing WebAssembly both on the client and on the server side. But basically what, what Ivan has been working on is um, using a feature with um, uh, is it called Leptos Cargo or Cargo Leptos? Cargo Leptos. Cargo Leptos, yeah. That will help us. Um, I assume we're building a server-side rendered application with some client-side logic in uh, as part of this. Um, and then yeah. we are use. Sorry? Sorry, no, I just, I was, yeah, absolutely. We <laughs> Okay, that. cool. <laughs> um, and then what we're also using is we're using this really, really cool 
feature in Leptos, which is called server-side functions, which, and we're going to dive into that a little bit later, but let's hold on for that, on to that for now, because uh, I think that we'll just slowly unwrap this. Um, but highly recommend going and reading this blog, and there's a lot of stuff in there. I want to call out that the integration work and everything is still very experimental. Um, contributions are welcome. I know you've been doing some work around this bin as well. Um, so yeah, let me let me show you how this thing works. So I I have I have the spin installed on my system here, and spin. So the starting point for building these things in this case at least is spin. You can definitely go the other way around as well. Um, part of spin has is a template system. Um, so if you run spin, uh, you'll be able to to install various templates for creating spin applications. And I'm just going to list out. I have. A lot of templates installed on my <laughs> machine uh, because basically <laughs> you can you can uh, you can reference a, a, a GitHub uh, repository or file or any HTML uh, HTTP endpoint and that you can host templates there. So you can see the Leptos application server side rendering template is actually on this uh, GitHub repo where we have all the integration work. Uh, and basically, the template is just a set of uh, files with some, you know, uh, scaffolding in there and some uh, templating uh, once you once you use the template. So what you would do is you will typically do something like spin template uh, add, and then you can point it to um, point it to the Git location uh, in this case, and then you get that template onto your machine. Once you have this, the template onto your machine, you can run a spin new command. And spin new is the command you would use to create a new application. Um, if I don't specify the template, I'm just going to do that here. Um, then let's just call this live stream. Um, I'm going to create a new application using that template. I'm going to call the application Let Us App Live. Now, the template asks me a few questions about, you know, I can give a description and I can choose the HTTP path that I want. Um, the spin part of the application to listen uh, to um, to listen to. Now, uh, let me go into the directory that was being created while we were setting this up, and let's take a look at what was scaffolded in here. I'm just going to get rid of that one. So the template is actually I a. Point out... oh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I should point out while we're talking about setup is that. Uh, we've actually created an official Leptos um, spin template, which actually just installs with Cargo Generate. As long as you have spin installed, you should be able to do it that way as well. Um, um, so yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a little different than this, I think, but it's pretty similar, okay. depending on which world you're coming from. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like with all those templating systems, where do you want to... Mm -hmm. um, how do you want to do that? Um, we, can, we can stick with this. I just wanted to point out that we do have this template. If you've yeah. used Leptos before or you want to try it um, through the one we maintain. Um, yeah. Cool. Let's do this. Um, so the, the layout of this application, now obviously we have some cargo definition in here to define whatever we need from the uh, Rust. Um, Requirements. There is one requirement as well to have um, Cargo Leptus installed. The README actually helps you through everything that needs to be uh, available or needs to be installed on your machine. Um, and then you can see there's a spin file down here. We'll, we can dive into that a little bit later. And then there's uh, various source files in here. And I think only two of those really matter. Uh, some of those we can consider like glue coded type of things that we have to just in this early iteration of the integration uh, are there. Um, but I assume these are all these are all part of the Leptus framework, right? Where you have the server and you have the actual application. Is that correct, Ben? Um, right. I guess you, I don't know if you'd call them part of the framework as much as um, how you build a Leptos app, but, but sure. Um, so if we look at the... Um, Let's look at the main.rs. Let's see what we've got in here. <laughs> okay. So this is a stub because um, yes. Leptospin does it differently. So let's look at server.rs then. 
So this file is gonna it contains all of our our server functions here. Um, mm -hmm. We can we'll we'll be talking a lot more about server functions, but yeah. Um, I, this yeah. is also this... where we actually does this the this is sort of the spin entry point, right? When you do mm -hmm. a call back into mm -hmm. back into the back end of it, the the HTTP component macro or is is the entry point you have of a spin application. So this is the the server side of that the server part of it. You can see in here some things. You know, we set up configuration, we build a routing table, we you know add server function prefixes. All of that stuff happens on the server in Leptos. Um, yep. But generally, you don't mess with this too much unless you're adding those things specifically. Most of your apps probably going to be an app. Yes. RS. So this is a great example of a Leptos component, right? We've got the component macro at the top, whose job really is to just build this into a struct. Um, and we have a regular Rust function, and it has to return impl into view um, or a type that. Well, I won't get into that. And then we've got a view macro <laughs> that lets you um, write what I call RSX, which is basically JSX, you know, JavaScript with HTML, but instead it's Rust with HTML. So you can kind of see it should look very familiar to you if you've ever played around with that stuff before. So yeah. We've got a bunch of different components. We've got the home page. Um, we've got a not found. Um, here's an example of our on-click handler. Uh, like if we were to render this page and, and look at it, I believe this just has a, a clicker on it that increases the counter while you click it. Yep. Um, and this is how we do it here. So this is a great we... example of, go ahead. Oh yeah, no, I just, so, so the way, so all of these components um, are then being, I assume they're being loaded into the app up here, right? Or how are they all yeah. being loaded together at runtime? Right. So we have a router, Leptos router. Um, yeah. So the way it typically works is that you will, um, for server-side rendering in the default mode, you will hit the server, it'll load the HTML, and then it will do the routing on the server. So for example, here, it would send if I loaded. Um, well, it was the only two routes, but if I loaded something, yeah. something other than the default route, it'll it'll load the not found. But if you're on the client, um, it won't hit the server because it has Leptos router in the WebAssembly itself. So it will mm. just navigate on the client. Um, okay, and then you can kind of see the named components there. The root route loads the home page component, which you can see. Right there, yeah, and it, it, yeah, and it it works pretty simply most cool. of the time. Let me do one thing. Let, I'm just gonna start a spin build command because I know I might have stuff, some stuff catch you, but <laughs> at least the first build takes a little little while. But basically, what we what we end up doing now is we take everything here and we create that um, that WebSMD component that will be loaded out to the client. Now the the question is then how do we actually get that WebSMD component to the client because that's a file we need to download, right? Mm -hmm. And the way that we do this with Spin is we can take a look into this TOML file. And the TOML file is for Spin application is sort of the, the manifest describing this application. This is what I talked about before where we can define all these various WebAssembly that are components being served from the server to whatever client is talking to a Spin, uh, spin application. In the manifest, we have a little bit of metadata in the top, and then we have uh, two, in this case, we have two triggers defined. So both of these triggers are based on HTTP, which means that they would listen for HTTP requests. We have the first one, which takes uh, the default, uh, sort of the root route, and the root route is gonna be handled by the laptop's app live component. And then we have another trigger down here, which is the package route, which is then being handled by the package component. Now, if we take the package component to begin with, because that, that's, that's the path we're on right now, we can see that this package component is using a WebAssembly that is actually pulled in from GitHub. And this is a WebAssembly component called a spin file server. 
So the spin file server is a WebAssembly component we built, which is da -da -da, a file server. So this is, this is a thing that can serve files to our client. And the file server has this, has this configuration where basically we map in you know, um, the root destination. So if you go slash package, um, we will map in whatever is in on the server side, what we have in target slash side set packages. So once we build the, uh, the Leptus application or the whole the spin and the Leptus application right now, if we take a look at the target and we look at side and we look at packages, we can see we have the WebAssembly um, that was generated from the Leptus application together with the JavaScript and CSS styling here. Which means that if I now run this application, we use spin up as the command to run this. We have this endpoint that is, that is the file server that will give the client what the client need for the um, uh, to actually render. And then we have the actual server, which is the other component in here, which is the whole WebSMD application that's actually the server side part of of what's, what's being built here. So if we go and hit this one, we can see that, and I'm just gonna show the, um, let's do some inspection here and we can actually see, I think this is where, <laughs> this is where we lost you the last time Ben, but hopefully this this works a little bit better. Yeah. Um, if I run the lane, you can see that we're actually getting the CSS, the JavaScript and the WebAssembly all being downloaded to our client right now. And we see those individual components show up over here. Uh, that was built part of the Leptus application. Absolutely. Uh, um, I like to point out with this kind of the size of the, the WebAssembly module, we try our best to reduce that because one of the things that WebAssembly is kind of for is large bundle sizes. Um, and we do a lot of work and we're doing a lot of work to make it smaller, but I imagine this is going to be pretty big. Um, I'm not sure if you're running in release mode. If you're not, it's going to be you know, even larger. But uh, we are running in release mode. Okay, good. I think. Oh, well, let's see. Yeah, we release, 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 release all the way. Okay. However, we don't do. I don't think we do any WebAssembly optimization in here. Uh, I think if right. you start stripping your WebAssembly from a lot of metadata and other things, we can get we can get far smaller. But yeah, if you remember the Hacker News Islands example I showed last time, we've got that down to fifty kilobytes, um, mm. and then even smaller than that um, with Greg's new um, renderer, which is coming out in the next release, hopefully. Um, so, cool. yeah. I, I do want to point out one thing, as you might have seen, like the the the, the time to actually get the the WebAssembly loaded, um, and this is one of the this is one of the the WASI, uh, one of the places where WASI is still maturing. Uh, the file server that we are using here does actually not use streaming yet. <laughs> mm. um, so so we do have streaming support. I think we have it now in WASI with the. 020 or the WASI Preview 2 release. Someone in chat, can you please correct me if I'm <laughs> if I'm wrong now? I know I have colleagues out there. Uh, but we haven't, we haven't, I don't think we've implemented that in our file server yet. So you should see the the ability to load things faster um, once we get once we get that in as well. I, I would uh, I would hope that you guys have streaming since I just I spent quite a bit of yesterday trying to make streaming work um, with Ivan uh, for point yeah. six. So you do. Yeah, I think you do. It is. It is. Well, we have had the preview two, the WASI preview two feature for a while in Spin, but it was oh. it was officially uh, um, released uh, last week uh, from from Bicode Alliance, who's who's doing that project. Um, oh, implementing was some time. Okay, so so so. This is sort of how we got the Lepsis application into our client, but I think the the mm -hmm. the. Where where Leptus and Spin, because up until now, the only thing we've sort of done with Spin is we've used it, uh, well, we used it for the templating, but as you say, there's another way you can do templating for Leptus applications, but we basically just use it as a file server, which in itself isn't that, that interesting, to be honest. <laughs> uh, there are probably a lot of better options out there if you just need a file server that has better scale and everything. Um, but what's interesting well, is the... 
Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say for for server side rendering, you're you're not just a file server, right? We I don't know if this page does it, but we actually stream down async function calls from the server. Like if you're loading data on the server and you mm -hmm. load it in a component, we will stream that down. Like we will start rendering the page immediately, and then we will populate the results once it's loaded. Um, okay. So you guys are doing a little bit more than just being a file server. Okay, that that's good. <laughs> that's good to hear. <laughs> I guess what I was trying to tee up to is like server functions and how server functions in Leptos yes. and, and the way that spin works actually is a pretty pretty awesome match. Um, so I love server functions. <laughs> yeah. So the I mean to start out where we want to get to is we want to actually enable, you know, being able to click this thing and have that data being persisted in a database mm. somewhere. Right. That's the goal with the application. And as you might have already seen here, as I start clicking this, there are call going out to a function called save, uh, save, or to a route called API and calling something called save function. And, you know, we can now see whatever the count is, and this is counting up. And what you might also have seen from my console over here is that the server is starting to output some, some logging that it is actually saving values somewhere. So if that's what this application does, then how did how did we get there? Well, let's go and take a look at what happens on in the application over here. Maybe Ben, do you want to talk about server functions to begin with, and then I can talk about how how spin um, sure what we can do with spin once we have the server functions up and running. Sure, absolutely. Server functions or isomorphic server functions or isomorphic functions or there's lots of fancy names for it. But the way it basically works is that on the server, you run a REST function, um, or you, well, you define a REST function, and you feed it to our server macro. And then when you're writing the components, um, you can call that server function on the client with arguments as if it's on the server, but it will run on the server. So it will actually generate you know, a network call from the client to the server with the arguments and then serialize, deserialize that, and then return the result to the client for, for viewing, right? Um, it basically builds a REST API endpoint um, for every one of your server functions and generates like, like the whole thing. And I, I love this feature. It's one of the first things that I worked on at Leptos um, and it is my favorite, absolutely. Um, you have to worry about serializing and deserializing. You keep the types across the boundary. You know, it's it's fantastic. So yeah, and and, and basically you, the, can, you can structure okay. your code in the way, right? So both the front end components that are described in here and the server side functions are just next to each other, right? It's really very easy to to sort of have all of that source together in here. It is an interesting distinction. Some people like to keep those things together. I like kind of like to put them in, like in their own folder, like I'm defining an API, but it's it's personal preference. Right? You can put them wherever you want yeah. and they will be visible. For sure. Yeah, and I think the, the I think the main the main the main point of it, I mean, for my side, it's like you 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 don't have to think about what you do on the server side and what you do on the client side as two distinct things, right? That have like own Build setups or even deployments and stuff like that. It's 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 all it's all just one thing, right? That crosses the boundary of the client and the server. It is. I mean, there's a little bit of boilerplate, and there are a couple things that you have to think about when you're writing these server functions that I can definitely talk about. Um, this is the server function itself. It returns um, returns nothing, I guess, but um, Somewhere in in your component, there should be an action or a form that triggers this. Um, yes, and they're kind of two parts of up. this arrangement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I guess in in the specific thing, what we did is we added an on click uh, event handler to the button, mm -hmm. and basically we then have um, I guess you call them signals, right? You have these signals in your Leptus mm -hmm. application that is that is state that we can store, um, but when it's a signal, it's only state known to the client, right? 
Uh, no. Um, let's let's take a brief detour into what signal signals are. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, and fine grain reactivity. I like to think of a signal as basically a bit of data that you want to keep track of, right? If it changes, mm -hmm. you want to know about it, and potentially you want other things to change based on it. So if you've got that bit of data in a fine grain reactive system, um, we can build what is essentially a tree of effects that um, that depend on or don't depend on the signal, right? So if we update the signal, maybe we need to re-render the number of clicks um, in the button, or maybe we need to um, run some kind of post-processing and turn it into base two. I don't know, something like that. But it really lets you selectively move through that. On the server, we have two reactive runtimes, basically. On the server, signals live in their own place, right? So if mm -hmm. you define a signal in the component on server rendering, it won't necessarily be the same signal that runs on the client. They're distinct. Okay. Yeah. So you can see the signal here. Um, we create it with create signal. It gives us a, a getter and a setter and then Wherever we use the getter, like if I write a function that has the getter in it, it will automatically subscribe that function to updates to the signal, which yep. is really neat once you get the hang of it, but can be a little bit different from React's. We're going to re-render the whole page and refetch all of the data when your data changes kind of model. Um, yeah. Sure. Yeah, and the and the way that we so the way that we are using it here is like in the event handler, we're actually using the setter to update that signal, right? Mm -hmm. And we are increasing our count over here. And then we move on to do, we spawn an async call, right? There's, I guess the spawn local is part of the Leptis framework in terms of how you can do async communication to the, uh, to the server. Yes, we've got a few different ways to do async. Mm -hmm. um, spawn local is one of them. Um, we typically don't use spawn local as much with server functions. Most of the time, we're going to use a resource or an action, uh, which are different kinds of inbuilt Leptos server components. But this absolutely works too. So, yeah. And yeah. by then, by calling the save count server function, or by by calling this function down here, we are now actually sending a call from the client into the server, right? And that's what we saw in, in the inspect, uh, when we were inspecting the the browser before and what was loading when the application was actually running there. So maybe I mean, let's that, take a look at what's happening in that function. Sorry, mm -hmm. Ben, you were saying something? That save, I mean, you can kind of see the magic there is we're calling yeah. save count in that function exactly like it was in the client, but it, it isn't, so. Exactly, yes. And this is where things are really cool because once we get into that function, we now know that we are on the server side. Yeah. And because we're on the server side, we can actually start using some of the spin features that are in there. So what we're doing in this example is that we're now, so we sort of bridge the world, right, of, the, of what happens in Leptis and what happens in spin. And we can start getting access to some of those features we haven't spin, like in this case, a key value store. Um, the spin key value store is basically a persistent store that depending on where your application low, uh, runs can have different implementations for the actual persistent layer. Um, when I run this on my client, it's basically a SQLite database that's loaded as a file. Um, if you... Um, if you run this in Fermion Cloud, which is a hosted offering we have for running uh, spin applications, it's backed by a persistent uh, a database that we have implemented up there. But you can also, through runtime configuration, um, have the um, have the data being persisted somewhere else. Like if you had a Redis server or something else, you can actually point it over there. So you have those those choices of where you want to actually persist the data. But what's really neat about this is that um, 
there's an easy way for, for us to basically open that store. So we use the spin SDK, we get into a key value namespace, we take the store and we open a default store. Stores can have any name. Uh, open default is sort of a convenient feature for a key value store that is named default. And you can see in the spin file how the component here gets access to that key value store by, by adding this. Uh... Yeah. Side note to this is if you have multiple spin components, they can share key value stores, but they can only access the key value store if they're explicitly allowed so in the configuration here. Um, um, so yeah. Um, let me go back to the app. Can you have so once we have at key value. Sorry. Uh, I was no, just gonna no. Add... Well, no, you can't do that. Then you would have to expose it uh, <laughs> through a component, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, not cross app, but within the same application you can have, and you can have as many key value stores within an application as you want. Uh, um, I think the typical example we do is we have we build an explorer. Uh, like a UI for you to see what's in your key value uh, store. So you can typically add that to your application and then you can start, uh, you can actually see okay. in an easy way what's in there if you don't want to dump the SQLite file, um, <laughs> which I sometimes tend to do because that's quicker. Um, <laughs> but what's, ni um, what's nice here is that once we have that store open, we now have a various sort of functions in here. Like we can, we can you know, check if something exists, we can go and get, um, um, we can get a value, we can just get all the keys in there, we can get the value passed into JSON, we can set something um, into JSON so we don't have to think about uh, serialization and all of that, or we can do our own um, direct set of the value. Um, so all of that, like a simple sort of like key value interface that's available there. And what you can see is we're going to set a key called Leptos app live count, and we're going to set the count, which is what was handed over to this function. Uh, which is the current value of the signal in this case. And basically this is now persisted um, on the server side. Um, to fully to fully actually uh, prove the point, let's go and add that key value explorer into my application. So in spin, we can add these new components that we want to run as part of our application by using this spin add command. And in this case, I'm just going to add this uh, key value explorer. And you can see in my spin app, we now have this component down here that was added, which also have access to that uh, default key value store. So we should be able to go into that and see that we actually have um, have this uh, value uh, persisted. I see I'm on a little bit of an older version of this that generates usernames and passwords for me, but okay. But we can see we now, we actually have the Leptus app live count in a database and we can see the, the current value is five of that one, which is what we would have expected. Um, so yeah, I guess that's sort of like, you know, showing how some of those server side spin features of key value store others are, you know, um, we also have SQLite interfaces. We have interfaces to use large language model and embeddings if you want to do something on the AI side. Um, you can easily do that together with your front end application um, in, in this integration setup. I like to point out with server functions that, you know, we talked about how that function runs in the server. So that means that you can have API keys in there. You can have, mm -hmm. um, if it was a traditional Leptos app, I'd say it doesn't need to compile to WebAssembly, but since it's been, it, it needs to compile to WebAssembly. Um, and sometimes that can be a little bit tricky, right? Not everything in the Rust ecosystem does compile to WebAssembly, um, but a lot of things do. And I, have, I haven't run into that limitation too much, but the primary way I've seen it so far is that um, the Axum server does not compile to WebAssembly. So we're Actix only right now, yeah. which is kind of a fun thing to find out. <laughs> Yeah, and there are there are some of the some of the limitations in the WASI implementations today that that may uh, impact that. Um, I'm not sure there is there is there is still stuff around, uh, and I don't know whether these are the relevant but the relevant ones. But there are still things around uh, 
uh, threads and other things that that aren't aren't in that specification yet and and isn't implemented. So yeah. So yeah, you want to take the the opportunity to show us the updated view here. In uh, or... what do you? In the application. Do you want to like live code a update count <laughs> server function? Um, to do what? To do to actually uh, to to read the value out again? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I actually I actually did prepare that. So <laughs> nice. maybe 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 I'm gonna show you that code and then you can tell me how to do that in the correct way. Should we do that? <laughs> sure. I bet you did it right though. I I, I have <laughs> faith in you, Mikhail. I've at least I've at least managed to make it work. Then let's see. <laughs> let uh, it might. Uh, let me see. I need to figure out where I'm at. Uh, I think this is. The I right think one. Ivan told me once he was while he was working on the integration, um, his tea always got cold, which <laughs> I'm not sure is good or bad. <laughs> so. That doesn't sound good. That does not sound good. <laughs> Uh, Maybe but anyways, let me try and walk you through with it. He forgot about his tea. <laughs> <laughs> At least let, let me show you what I did here that actually works, and then we can sure. we can see. You know, maybe you can explain some of the things that that could have could have could have been done differently. But what I did, like this is this is basically the save count function, the same as we mm -hmm. saw before, and I just added a, another function that I on the server side I call that get count. Um, and it doesn't take any argument in because I've hard coded the key, but we could have passed the key around if you wanted to have different different things in there. Sure. Um, but but this is really all of this is just regular spin <laughs> spin code. <laughs> Again, I'm gonna opening my store, and now I'm gonna use get JSON. I'm gonna look for this key. Um, actually, this this can return uh, a none. Um, Huh. Well, okay. return non if it doesn't find the key. So we we should, you know, check for that. But <laughs> let's just unwrap it and move on for now. And then basically we're going to return the count back. So that's that's basically my server side function. Um, okay. The one thing that I actually had to do, and I know there was a discussion about it, but I actually needed to go and register it in mm, the uh, yes. in the server RS file as well. Um, you should yes. have get count name that was provided in the macro. We, on traditional platforms, we use the inventory crate, which does some neat mm. tricks to automatically register server functions without you having to call any. Um, before we implemented inventory, we had to do this for every for every server function. And we get tons of different people, you know, going, why doesn't my server function work? And, you know, the first question was always, you know, did you register yeah. your server function right there? Um, but unfortunately, inventory doesn't work in WASI, so you guys have to register them. But once I have that, then the way that I hook this up into my client is I basically spawn an async. I use the spawn <laughs> local function here again, okay. um, calling the function to get my count and then calling the setter on the signal to actually set the value that is returned by my function. Okay. So I did notice that it's get triggered more than once as I'm loading it. Uh, but okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, we can see this in action. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's see this in action for sure. Uh, let's just make sure that I think this was. Most of this was built, so it should always be ready. Um, so yeah, we can go back and we can see that it's already read, like because I'm loading this um, every time that I get this back. So every time I refresh this, it actually gets the value. I think if we look at the inspector, we should be able to see that as well. Uh, let's pull the network up. And so we can see the get count function being called down here as part of loading the page. And then that is then returning 19, which we can also see is the value that is that is stored. So now we have now we actually have the data persisted uh, in that SQLite file that we have locally and being able to beat it back. 
<laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so this is this is a decent way to do it. Um, the biggest thing I would probably say is that you could replace one of these with an action and one of these with a resource. Okay. Now, the reason you might want to do that, besides the fact that we abstract like all the spawn local away and, and some of that stuff, um, you can show different things while the, like if the app was loading, for example. Um, yeah. Or if you got an error, you could show them a different view. Um, the mm. Leptos spin repo that I wrote um, um, when I modified Ivan's actually has an example of the resource and the action in it. And I put a link in the stream yard. But basically, a resource will start running on the server and as part of the rendering process if you're on the initial route. And then it will stream the result down to the client. Um, and then an action can be triggered um, usually like a, with a form or a button or whatever, and it will send it. And you can see kind of in this view that it's a little bit different. It's a little bit simpler. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, so, so, the, so you create a resource here. Mm -hmm. And so I, get, I assume increment count is the server function, right? Yes. You call me. And yes. so you have an update count. I'm just going to have these. Uh, oh, sorry. Update count and get count. Uh, the increment, oh, count, increment is count is the action is, there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So you create increment count as an action, and then you create this resource. And one of the neat things about this is that um, you can kind of see in that resource, the first argument is a call to increment count dot version dot get. And what mm -hmm. that does is that if you click that button, that resource will essentially rerun and get or and update the value and get and update your view. So you'd actually, you know, be able to see that in, in real time through the reactive system. Okay. Um, besides that, I think we did things okay. yep. pretty similarly. Cool. So that's that's good work. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. And obviously, I think I think there's some like you can see how. Well, it would be interesting at one point at least to drive into more of a CRUD type of API. You know, where mm -hmm. you would be thinking about I actually have like a model here, and I want to put and delete and get and all of that um but i think i think we're getting at time for this stream but it might be a good follow-up i know two weeks from now there's actually going to be a stream where adam sabatka is going to join uh, sohan and they will talk about an application he built uh, using leptos uh, and spin integration as well um so the token share application um so i think there might be an opportunity to go even deeper on how this whole integration work but I think for now, um, thank you so much, Ben, uh, for joining yeah. us yeah. here today. Uh, I think I think we got through things, even though we had the technical stuff we had to deal with. And I hope that people got, you know, everyone who was watching, um, got a sort of an introductory, high-level type of idea about how this whole spin and leptus integration work, how each of them brings something into the mix, and once you want to build this application that enables you some great serverless type function uh, with great UI and way of integrating yeah. that, that this, this is definitely an option to try out. I should say um, we didn't get a chance for questions and answers. So if you have questions you'd like to ask, you're welcome to join our Leptos Discord and ask them. Um, you could even contact me through one of the various methods with them. I, I love answering Leptos questions. Um, and yeah, I want to thank Ivan for reaching out and kind of starting this whole process of building the Leptos Spin integration. You know, I, I am so excited to have a WebAssembly serverless functions framework as an option. So um, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Ben. And thanks, everyone, for sticking around and keeping, you know, keep, 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 
staying on the stream even though we had to find ways around this uh i you know yeah lepsis discord there's a spin discourse as well and then we will help cross pollinate the things that you know <laughs> you guys need help with uh but thanks thanks everyone for watching and again thank thank you very much ben for for attending today thank you bye cool. have a great day everyone bye bye